and physical money of the third, we can link taken from the fourth book of Kings, chapter 5. In those days, Naaman, general of the army of the Syrian king of Syria, was a great man with his master, and honorable. For by him the Lord gave deliverance from Syria, and he was a valiant man and rich, but a leper. Now there had gone out robbers from Syria, and had led away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited upon Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish my master had been with the prophet that is in Samaria. He would certainly have healed him of the leprosy which he hath. Then Naaman went in to his lord and told him, saying, Thus and thus said the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said to him, Go, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment, and brought the letter to the king of Israel in these words. When thou shalt receive this letter, know that I have sent to thee Naaman my servant, that thou mayest heal him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel had read the letter, he rent his garments and said, Am I God to be able to kill to give life? But this man hath sent me sent to me to heal a man of his leprosy. Mark and see how he seeketh occasions against me. And when Eliseus, the man of God, had heard this, to wit that the king of Israel had rent his garments, he said to him, saying, Why hast thou rent thy garments? Let him come to me, and let him know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of the house of Eliseus. And Eliseus sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and thy flesh shall recover health, and thou shalt be clean. Naaman was angry and went away, saying, I thought he would have come out to me, and standing would have invoked the name of the Lord his God, and touched with his hand the place of the lepers, and healed me. Are not the Abana and the far, far rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel, that I may wash in them and be made clean? So as he turned and was going away with indignation, his servants came to him and said to him, Father, if the prophet had bid thee, do some great thing, surely thou, thou shouldst have done it. How much rather what, the, what he now hath said to thee, wash and thou shalt be clean. Then he went down and washed in the Jordan seven times, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored, like the flesh of a little child, and he was made clean. And returning to the man of God with all his train, he came and stood before him and said, in truth I know, there is no other God in all the earth, but only in Israel. In the Gospel, take that according to St. Luke chapter 4. At that time, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Doubtless you will say to me this similitude, Physician, heal thyself. As great things as we have heard done in Capernaum, do also there here in thy own country. And he said, Amen, I say to you that no prophet is accepted in his own country. In truth I say to you, there were many widows in the days of Elias in Israel, when heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there was a great famine throughout all the land, and to none of them was Elias sent, but to a widow of Sarepta and of Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Eliseus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed but Naaman the Syrian. And all day the synagogue hearing these things were filled with anger, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they brought him to the brow of the hill whereon, whereon their city was built, and they might that they might cast him down headlong. But he passed in the midst of them, went away, went his way. Let's follow the words of today's morning. Each day there are many beautiful readings, contemplations in the season of Lent, the sacred season of preparation for the battle of Good Friday. And today our Lord is in the city of Nazareth, his hometown. He is in the place where he spent almost all of his time on this earth. He spent no more time in any place than he spent in the city of Nazareth. He was there from six, six or seven years old after leaving Egypt, 
until he was, until he was 30 years old with a brief <coughs> visit to the, to the city of Jerusalem when he was 12. He spent the vast majority of his entire life on this earth in the city of Nazareth, and it was his own town. He came to that city, and they were not interested in him, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated him everywhere, but a special hatred of him, and that owned his own city. St. Augustine speaks about it, and then before he warned them, therefore our Lord says to them, Perhaps now you are telling me this similitude, says Christ to the Jews of Nazareth. Physician, heal thyself. You perform so many miracles in Harnam, and Christ, Christ committed, performed so many hundred thousands and thousands and thousands of miracles in Harnam. Why don't you perform them here in your own city? There are so few miracles. And then our Lord said to them a warning, a warning that he says to Catholics, and all those who have the faith and take it for granted. And he says to them a great warning, and the warning is, he says, there were many, many widows in the time of Elias in Israel, but to none of them was Elias sent. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, but to none of them was Elias sent, but to Naaman of Syria. And even Naaman, when he came in, you read about him in the epistle today in the fourth book of Kings, when Naaman came in, he was a great general, and it says, and also points out this truth that all Catholics are supposed to know. Naaman was a Syrian. Naaman was not a belonger, did not belong to the true religion. He was belonging to false religion and worshiping false gods. He worked for the king of Syria, who was not a friend of God. And what does it say in the sacred scripture? It's not the only place it says it. God blessed Naaman and gave him victories in battle. God blessed Naaman and made it possible for him to have success before his king. We must know this about every blessing that comes into the world. Every blessing comes from God. and doesn't come from anywhere else. So Naaman was a, a, an upright man, but he did not yet know the true religion. But Naaman was a leper. And Naaman then, well, there was a Jewish girl who was captured in battle and, and, and was brought to the house of Naaman and was a servant of his wife. And she was a slave of his wife. And she said, in my country there is a great prophet. Here we notice another thing concerning the supernatural. It will not always be the wise, the leaders, the great ones, but those captured in battle and those that are slaves that will be the ones who will bring about the salvation of souls. God's grace works where He wills, and He works in small and little ways. And so the maid, she said to the mistress, the, the wife of Naaman, In my country there is a great prophet in the land of Samaria in Israel, and he could cure Naaman of his leprosy. And then Naaman went to the king of Syria and said, There is a maid girl here. We captured in battle not so long ago. And she says that there is a great prophet in Israel. And the king of Syria said, Good, send the, the 60,000 pieces of silver and the ten changes of raiment and talents and go over to the king of Israel and ask to be cured. And what happens when Naaman goes to the king of Israel? He goes to the king of Israel who belongs to the true religion. To the king of Israel who is not worshipping false gods. And who is supposed to know the truth. And when he goes to the king of Israel, he says, I have been sent by my master that I might be cured of the leprosy that was given to me. And the king of Israel says, am I God? Can I kill? Can I give life? Can I do these things? I cannot be done. And he rent his garments. And the word went to Elizabeth the prophet. Why did you rent your garments? There is a prophet in Israel. There is God in Israel. And he is nowhere else. And what happens in the miracle of Naaman? Naaman, Naaman at the very end of the miraculous cure, he will say, I know there is no God except the God in Israel. There is no God other than the Catholic God. There is no God other than the God of Israel. The God of Isaac, the God of, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he uses small things in order to bring about the great victory of souls. 
Naaman was guilty of great pride. He was brought before the prophet, but Elizaeus was busy. He didn't have time to see Naaman. And therefore, he sent his servant, Jesse, to go out and tell Naaman that he wishes to be cured of his leprosy, go and wash seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman was offended. Now, at the time in which Israel loses the faith, you know, the foundation of our faith is humility. The foundation of everything is humility. And when the faith is lost, pride rules the world. Pride rules everywhere. The enemies of God are always filled with pride. Those of all are always filled with pride. But when humility is taken away, pride rules the world. And it is only defeated by humility, only defeated by small things. And that is why God has chosen small little things to bring about the salvation of souls and the salvation of the world. So in any case, Naaman was offended. I came to my country. I came with all this money. I came with letters from my king. I didn't come to hear a servant come and tell me to take a bath seven times in the Jordan. He was very offended by that. There are rivers in my country that are better than all the rivers of Israel. I go and wash in those rivers and I shall be made clean. I don't need to wash in your rivers. And he turned away in alienation and he left. But then what happened? His servants. We are in such an age today in which it is so often said, I'm not the Pope. I'm not the Bishop. I'm not the priest. I'm not the man in charge. I'm not the king. I'm not the one who makes decisions. What can I do? I just have to wait for better times. Yet we see here, if it wasn't for a slave girl that was captured, and wasn't for other slaves that were traveling with Naaman, there would be no miracle. There would be no cure. There would be no salvation. Each of us has a part to play in the divine economy, and no one is useless in the divine economy. A little young a, young, a man who was a recent widower, walking to Mass one day, knowing little about the Catholic religion, being only Catholic for only a few years, or less than a year, a very short time, he saw the Blessed Virgin Mary Guadalupe, and transformed and brought about, became an instrument of conversion of millions and millions and millions of souls, and the three children of Fatima, saying there were brief versions of the Hail Mary. They wanted to get the rosary out quickly before they could go and play. And so they said, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. They didn't want to say the whole thing. Because they had to go play. And it was to these children who had the abbreviated version of the Hail Mary and the Holy Mary without saying Hail Mary full of grace. Holy Mary, Mother of God. The Blessed Virgin may appear to these little children and through them gave the answer to all the troubles of our times. God has not changed. He will use small things to change and transform the world. And one of these greatest things he gave us is the Holy Scatter. It is one of the most beautiful gifts that heaven has ever given to earth. And it's given by Our Lady of Mount Carmel. 800 years before Christ was born, Elias walked up the mountain of Carmel. And he fought a great battle against the priests of Baal. And killed 400 priests of Baal. And the three and a half years of famine came to an end. And there came a cloud off of the Mediterranean Sea, shaped like a foot. And the cloud was coming to the land. And Elias looked at the cloud and said, You see that cloud? This cloud is coming to bring an end to the drought. This cloud is coming to bring an end to the chastisement. And this ground and this mountain has been so hard for the last three and a half years of drought. You go down that mountain, Acab, you go down that mountain with your chariots, you go with great haste, because if you don't leave right now, there'll be so much mud on the mountain that your chariots will be stuck and you won't be able to get down the mountain. Move with great haste, because the greatest rain is coming. This rain was not like the rain of the flood. 
He was the reign of Mary. And that reign came. And that reign gave life. And that reign ended the flood. Ended, ended the drought. And there came a great peace in Israel because of Elias. He then put men on that mountain to pray. To pray to the future mother who would come to be the mother of God. And on Pentecost Sunday, 800 years later, men who were the followers of Elias, they came down the mountain by the inspiration of God, and they went to the city of Jerusalem. They would occasionally travel there once a year, once in, not every year, but every, every so often they would go to Jerusalem around the time of the, of the great feast, either of the, the, the Easter feast or the Passover or the, or, the, or the Pentecost, which is also a Jewish feast. And they went into the Feast of Pentecost, and they walked in the city of Jerusalem, and there they saw St. Peter. And they were amongst the first of those 3,000 that were baptized on Pentecost Sunday. And then they went back to the mountain. They met the Holy Mother of God. They saw her, and they went back to the mountain, and they devoted themselves to prayer and to that lady. And built the very first church in honor of Our Lady in the history of the world. Then the Muslims came to cause trouble a thousand years later and conquered over the city of the, the, all of the Holy Land. And they caused trouble for those holy monks on the Mount of Carmel, where there was just one monastery of monks that lived on that mountain from generation to generation. And there was an English crusader who came over to, to fight the crusades, and he saw the distress of those monks on that mountain. And he was the Earl of, of, uh, of, Gray, of, the, of the Baron de Grey of Aylesford, England. He had come back with me to England. And he took them with him back to England in 1241 AD. And they arrived back in England, and there he gave them a little house in Aylesford where they would have their house and be able to continue to pray in peace and be monks. And ten years later, the superior of them, St. Simon the Stock, and the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to her and gave the gift of the scapular. A very simple little cloth. Those who are filled with pride, those who have uh, confidence in other things besides the simple things that God gives us, they cannot comprehend the power and the beauty of the Holy Scapular. Naaman was afraid to take a bath, but he was finally told by his soldiers, Go and take that bath seven times in the Jordan. And he did, and he was cured. And he was the one that had the faith. He was the one that received the faith, whereas in Israel they had forgotten about the very faith that was supposed to be theirs. And this is happening in our Holy Church today. We want our security in the approval of modernist Rome. We want our security in the approval of our government. We want our security in the approval of those around us. When the only approval that matters is the approval of heaven. That's the approval that matters. No other approval matters. And so in any case, the scapular was given to St. Simon Stock there in 1251. And the Blessed Virgin Mary said to her, Whoever dies wearing the scapular, they shall not burn in the fires of hell. They shall be saved. And that it also shall save from pestilence. It shall save from, uh, from, from great uh, calamities. This scapular shall save in many ways. But those who die wearing the scapular, they shall not burn in hellfire. And over the very day which he had a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Simon Stock, the priest, the spirit general of the, of the, of the, of the Mount Carmel, of the, of the Carmelites, he was told there's a man dying. My brother is dying. He hates God. He hates religion. He hates the church. He refuses to repent. But please come to his deathbed. And St. Simon's thought went from appearing to Our Lady and said, Our Lady gave him this brown scapular, and he had the scapular freshly given to him, and he went over to the man, and sure enough, the man would not repent. So he took off his scapular, and he placed it upon him. And as soon as he put the scapular upon the dying man, immediately he repented of his sins. And this was the first day of the scapular. The very first day. Later on, the popes spread the devotion of the scapular around. The first pope to wear the scapular was Pope Gregory X, only a hundred years or seventy years after the death of, of after the giving of the scapular. 
And when he died, 600 years later, his body was dug up. And when his body was dug up, his bones had been rotted, his clothing had rotted, but his scapular was 100% intact. And the same is true of St. Alphonsus and St. John Bosco. When they were dug up, in order to see about their canonization, their bones and their clothing was rotted. But the scapular that Alphonsus wore when he died was 100% intact. And St. John Bosco, when he was dug up also, his body was rotted and decayed, his clothing was decayed, but his scapular 100% intact. The scapular is, is a great protection. It is a reminder that you must perseveringly love God, perseveringly stay in the faith, perseveringly go after Him. And it brings about many conversions. A priest in Chicago in the 1940s, going to anoint a man who's going to who's dying, he refused the faith. He said, he was talking about, I don't want to go back. I refuse. I refuse. I will not repent. He said, all right, will you do one thing for me? Wear the scapular. Put on the scapular. Put on the scapular. And he came back an hour later. And the man repented. Another one was told by his friends, wear the scapular. So he wore the scapular. And he wore the scapular, but he was not a Catholic. He got into a major car accident. And he was, he was dying, he was in the hospital. The nurse saw him with his captor and called the priest. The priest came over to anoint him. He was given the anointing. The man woke up from his coma. He said, oh, Father, I'm not a Catholic. He said, oh, I thought you were a Catholic because you were wearing the scapula. He said, no, I'm not a Catholic. Why do you wear the scapula? My friends told me to wear it. Do you want to be a Catholic? Yes, Father, I want to be a Catholic. I want to be a Catholic. And so he baptized him and received him to the church, and he died with the sacrament. Another man in the 1930s in Ohio was trying to run across the railroad tracks. Young boy, trying to beat the train. He didn't beat the train. He was daring with his friends, and he ran across the track. And the train cut him in half. It cut his stomach and his legs completely in half. And he lay on the ground, wearing a scapular, but he did not die. Normally, they die instantly. He said, get the priest. And it was in the early days, around 1900 or so, the 1930s, they went and got the priest in 45 minutes. The priest came, anointed him, received fully the sacraments, and then he died. And so remember that there are many, many miracles of this holy scapular. One time a French priest was on his way to say Mass for a mission. And he realized he'd taken off his scapular, take it back, and he'd forgotten to put it back on again. And he was going to be late for the mission. He said, well, I, I never, today is the Feast of Our Lady, and I never say Mass of Our Lady without wearing the scapular, so they'll just have to have Mass late. So he went back, he got his scapular, he went over and started celebrating Mass, and probably celebrating Mass, an anti-religious man came in with a gun, and he shot him. And he continued the Mass until the end. And they thought that the man shot missed him, but afterwards the Mass, they checked, and the bullet was lodged in the scapular. He didn't even feel it. He thought it missed, but the bullet was lodged in the scapula. And many other times, similar things have happened. And on both sides, on both sides, in the 1930s in Spain, there were seven communists who were guilty of great crimes of murder and so on. The communists often were guilty of those kinds of crimes and sentenced to death. And the priests came to the seven communists and tried to convert them. They refused to convert. Finally, he says, all right, I'll come back one last time since you're going to die tomorrow, and I'll just bring wine and cheese and, and some food, and it's just talk. I won't talk about religion. So they sat around and they talked for about an hour. And he said, I only have one request. Will you wear the scapula? And six of them said yes, and they agreed to wear the scapula. Then he continued to talk and drink. And they, all six of them converted and went to confession. Then they put pressure on the seventh one. Said, you should also wear the scapular. He says, I will not wear the scapular. Wear the scapular. All right, he finally agreed to wear the scapular. And he said, I'm not going to confession. I will not go to confession. The next morning, they were out to the firing squad. All seven of them were in the scapulars. They went out to the firing squad. All seven were shot. And six of them were found with their scapulars on. And 50 paces away was found the scapular of the one who did not repent. No one ever saw the scapular fall off. No one ever saw it really disappear. And Claude de Colombier, blessed Claude de Colombier, St. Claude de Colombier, the, the priest who was uh, the confessor of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, 
great devotee of the scapular, he says, the scapular is a reminder that we must live with God and that we must we want to die with God. But what if you want to die in your sins and you wear your scapular? You will die in your sins. You will not die with your scapular. And so it has happened many, many times. Many, many times. And remember, the scapular is a great weapon. It's a great defense. And it is a gift from heaven. And it is a clothing that has protected many, has saved many souls and saved many bodies. One time a house in Germany, in West Bolton, in Germany, where there was a whole row of houses all caught on fire. All the houses were on fire. And as they went out from the houses, all connected one to another, 22 homes were burned down. One of the boys said, I want to let Mary please protect our house. And he took the scapular and hung it on the door. And every other house was burned down completely. And that house was not touched. There have been many, many times. In my own life, I was in the Philippines, a young girl. She was in a, in, a, in a tricycle. She was wearing her scapular and no one else was. The little tricycle, motorcycle, the sidecar came out on the road. A jeepney came and hit it and killed every single person except for her. She wasn't even harmed. She was thrown away, landed in the nearby, and not even harmed. No harm whatsoever, because she's wearing the scapular. Many, many cases. But remember that the scapular is a great gift given to us by God, gift given to heaven, and that the Lord wants us to believe in simple things. Naaman at first not believe that a simple thing could get him salvation. But he finally submitted. And he received his salvation. And so it is until the end of time. And also God uses simple souls. We can't claim that oh, because I'm, I'm not the Pope, I'm not the Bishop, I'm not the priest, I'm not, not this, not that. We must, each of us, have our part to play in saving souls. We have to do something to try to save souls. We've got to be able to hold the Holy Faith, speak of the Holy Faith. It was a thief who was condemned and who was guilty he was the one that spoke out on Good Friday. He is the one that said in the presence of all, this man has done no wrong. The truth must be said, even in the most difficult times. St. Peter didn't say it. St. John, even though he was there before the cross, he didn't say it. But the thief said it. This man has done no wrong. But we suffer the just reward for our crime. The truth must be spoken in all ages, in all times, and not only by the wise and great ones, but also by those that are condemned and despised, by the slaves, and by those that have no power in the world. So many times Christ has used those who have no power. The woman at the age, the 80-year-old Anna, in the, in the temple of Jerusalem, she went around, over 80 years old, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here. Who's going to listen to an old lady? Who's going to listen to her? And yet when she went out speaking, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here. So many souls are benefited. The truth was spoken. The priest didn't speak it. The brother, the, the elders didn't speak it. But this woman spoke it, and Simeon spoke it. An old man also despised. He spoke the truth to the Blessed Virgin Mary. He spoke the truth to St. Joseph. And she spoke to all. So they must remember that the truth cannot be held down, the faith cannot be held down. We must have confidence in the victory of Mary in our present crisis. So many times souls have been saved from pestilence, they have been saved from war, from, from, from death, and their souls have been saved because of the power of the scapular. But there must be a faith that goes along with it. When the Queen of the Ocean ship was traveling in 1845 from England to the United States, and there was a Mr. Fisher, a Protestant minister, and his wife, and the ship was being tossed in a great storm, and they thought they were all going to die. And he went up on the top of the, of the ship in order to commit the mercy of God with his Protestant wife and his children. And a young boy named John McCullough, an Irish boy, he was on the same ship. He went to the top of the ship, and he saw this terrible situation. The ship was about to sink, and he took off his scapular and made the sign of the cross of the waves, and he threw the scapular into the ocean. And instantly, just like in the gospel, the, the water stopped and the boat arrived and the storm was over. And one last wave pushed the, threw the scapular back on the, on, the, on the deck. 
And then John McAuliffe put it back on. And those Protestants became Catholic. And they said, Mr. Victor said, I want the protection of that lady. How did you do that? I did it with a scapula. It is a scapula of Mary. It is found only in the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And Mr. Fisher and his wife and the other Protestants who were there on the ship became Catholics and entered the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And so the fact is, we must have great confidence and power in the power of the Holy Scapular and the gifts that God has given to us. And that let us be persevere in our holy faith. And remember the small things of what God uses in order to get bring about His great victories. He uses the weak to confound the strong, the ignorant to confound the wise, and He uses small little things to defeat the enemies of God. I'm closing with you all in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost.